We're so glad to have you all with us. My name is Dahlia Habib Linson. My pronouns are she, her. I wanna thank you for being here in our workshop, What is American? Native American Art the second in our spring lineup of educator workshops. We welcome you to join us for our remaining sessions this spring and invite you to check out the resources on our webpage for more information. With that, I'll turn it over to our next slide. Tess, before we introduce you, may we invite you to do the land acknowledgement. Absolutely. Uh, hello, my name is Tess Lukey, and I'm the Curatorial Research Associate in the Art of the Americas Department at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Although I'm not physically there now, we would like to acknowledge that the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, founded in 1870, stands on the historic homelands of the Massachusetts people, a site long, which has long served as a place of meeting and exchange among different nations, including my own. The museum acknowledges the long history of the land it occupies today and seeks ways to make indigenous narratives more prominent in its galleries and programming. We can all learn more about the Massachusetts people who continue to be one of many indigenous stewards of this land at, by visiting massachusettribe.org. Thank you so much, Tess. Hi, I'm Emily Scheinberg. I'm head of teacher and educator uh, professional development and resources at the MFA. And I want to thank you for coming this evening and um, make a note that this workshop is being recorded and it may be uploaded in the future um, to YouTube and the museum's website. We'll primarily upload uh, the portions of the workshop with our featured speaker. But if you are concerned about being featured, you can go ahead and turn off your video um, and keep that mute on. Uh, more information here uh, is that there are transcripts and closed captioning available for this through, excuse me, <laughs> for this program through um, Rev for Zoom live captions. And if you go down to that bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click that little up arrow um, in order to show subtitles. If anyone has any trouble with their live captions, um, please write in the chat. Uh, and uh, our colleague Sophia Walter, who we thank for all of her assistance with putting this program together, can help you uh, with that. Um, please do use the chat if you have questions. Um, you can share comments, and we'll have time for Q and A at the end as well. And I'll turn it back over to Dahlia. Thank you, Emily. Um, this slide describes our overview for this afternoon. We are going to um, have a presentation by our wonderful colleague, Tess Lukey, and we will include breakout rooms with a focused activity. We'll leave some time for discussion and questions and answers. Um, and we are going to close with a survey upon which we are really excited to get your feedback. We welcome feedback in all of our programs and certainly including our educator workshops as we, which help us tremendously in terms of planning for future workshops. Your responses are really important in helping us to shape our future digital programs. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our funders. Expanded teacher and student resources are supported by Arbella Insurance Foundation. Educator workshops are also presented with support from the RAB Goldberg Connors Fund for Teacher Resources and the Louise O and Robert F. Levin Fund for Innovation in Teaching, with additional support from Sharon A. Miller. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Tess Lukey is a member of the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Head, Aquina, and the Curatorial Research Associate in the Art of the Americas Department at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. She is currently working on projects that are focused on reorienting the understanding of what American art is and can be. She's recently opened the exhibition, Collecting Stories, the Invention of Folk Art at the Museum of Fine Arts, which will run from February 6th through January 9th of 2022. Tess has a bachelor's degree in ceramics and art history from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design and a master's degree in Native American art history with a minor in museum studies from the University of New Mexico. Her master's thesis focused on tracing the influence of historic Helsuk mask making traditions 
on the contemporary artworks of the Heltzuk artist, Sean Hunt. Her area of expertise is ancient and historic Native American materials dating before the 20th century. And she has experience in Mayan art history, folk art, NAGPRA, and is up to date on current museum practices and theory. She's worked for the Society of Arts and Crafts in Boston and the John Summers Gallery in New Mexico. She's also completed fellowships at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, and the Hibben Center for Archaeology Research and the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In her spare time, she's a traditional potter and basket weaver practicing in the techniques of her own indigenous community. So Tess, um, I invite you to join me on this virtual stage and welcome you so much. Um, and thank you for being here to give this talk. Over to you. Hold on, let me get my, my screen up for you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tess Luki, and I'm a member of the Aquina Wampanoag Tribe and the Curatorial Research Associate in the Art of the Americas Department. Kapapatash, thank you, Emily, Dolly, and Sophia, for inviting me to speak to you all today. I would first like to acknowledge that though the MFA is located on the land of the Massachusetts people, I am currently located in Westboro, Massachusetts, on the unceded homelands of the Nipmuc Nation, who have called this area home since time immemorial. Now, before I get started, I thought we might work together to create a small KWL. I'm sure you're all familiar with what this is, but for those who don't, a KWL is a three-columned approach to understanding your knowledge of a particular subject. There are three sections, what I know, what I want to know, and what I learned. We will work on the first two before the presentation and discuss the third column at the end of the session during the Q&A. So could people raise their hand and let me know what they know about Native Americans, Native American art, and Native American history of New England? You can just unmute yourself and uh, and speak because I can't see everyone currently actually. Um, hi, uh, my name is Deidre um, and I'm excited to listen and learn. Um, something that I learned when I visited Aquina is that a lot of the natural materials from that area um, were used in the process of making art and, um, and artisanry, such as the clay from the cliffs that are pictured behind you mm -hmm. um, and the, the beautiful shells that have the purple in them, the, the clam shell, the, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the quahog shells. Um, that's a bit of what I know. Anyone else? Don't be afraid. It's okay if you don't only know a little bit. It's it's that's the, the point of this. And as Emily mentioned in the chat, you're welcome to type something into that box and we'll be happy to repeat it verbally. Laura, the question is, what do you know about Native Americans? What do you know about Native American art? And what do you know about Native American history of New England, if you know anything? And that may be the thing. What I know is that I don't know. I, um, I know that um, the people on the coast of Maine, the Native Americans on the coast of Maine use sweet grass to um, make baskets um, and other useful, beautiful items. I also know that um, 
birch bark is used to make beautiful things and it's sewn together with, uh, I think some kind of gut. I'm not sure what that is. Um, so that goes along with more, you know, natural materials that are used. And I know the Algonquin Indians lived in New England, I believe. I don't know if I've got that right. <laughs> Among other tribes, I think. Looks like we have a couple of other responses, Tess, in the chat. Uh, Mary says, I know about the importance of the ash tree to the Wabanaki peoples for canoe construction and basket making. Um, it was all it was all handmade. They probably didn't have any uh, very sophisticated machinery. We're thinking about tools um, and how we um, contextualize that also. I'm going to read a couple things. And I also wanted to note, I think someone was going to speak in a second. Um, there are notes about, um, uh, someone says, I feel it's narrative. It can symbolize things and carry on tradition. So thinking about some questions um, there, I think related to Native American art. Native people have lived here for thousands of years. Um, and um, that many um, Native tribes recognize a third gender or two-spirited people. Uh, there's also mention that there are Indigenous people throughout the Americas. Um, and someone um, noting that they live on Wampanoag lands in, um, I'm not sure actually how to pronounce this exactly, Masquanica. Um, oh, yep. thank you. Um, and the use of porcupine quills um, to dye and make baskets um, and other mentions of land that's lived on the Abenaki. And I think Deb, um, you were going to speak. Did you want to add something? Someone in the chat? You can unmute. Um, yes, hi everyone. Um, and thank you for putting this workshop on. Um, I, my question or my uh, thought here is maybe a little bit different. Um, I come from, come from an art historical approach and act and um, therefore want to just comment that what I know about, which is very little about Native American art is that it was um, collected uh, in the 19th century from a more ethnographic perspective. Uh, and that um, it had, you know, it, it, the uh, collectors were uh, convinced that uh, the Native Americans would be disappearing off the face of the earth, and that therefore um, it was important to bring their materials and their and their uh, creations uh, to light. Um, uh, forgetting a little bit about the fact that, in fact, that was sort of a, um, uh, what's the word, um, what's the expression, a, um, um, never mind, anyway. Uh, um, and so, so that's a, just a different, a, a different piece of knowledge, I guess, is thinking about it historically. Thank you, Deb. All these were great, everyone. I really appreciate learning what you guys know, and that's quite a lot. I'm really, su really surprised and actually really happy to hear all the things that you're saying to me. Um, what I, I want to now move on to what I want to know. Are there things specifically that you really want to know when we talk about today? I, I don't know if we'll cover this kind of thing, but um, as a member as a faculty member at the undergraduate level and wanting to uh, enhance and expand the American art history uh, um, curriculum. Um, I'd be interested in, in thoughts and discussion of how to make that a more seamless um, uh, and um, yeah, more seamless and, and together, you know, kind of curriculum. Sorry, not saying it very well. <laughs> I 
And no topic but, is too small. More about, I, Rita, you say you want to know more about traditions and the culture, okay. I don't know if I could type today. I have, um, maybe it might be a complicated question, but a couple years ago, we visited the Wampanoag Cultural Center at Aquina. Mm -hmm. um, and there were these displays there that talked about um, upcoming celebrations. Now, this was a couple years ago. They were talking about what um, the plans might be for acknowledging the year 2020, the 400 year, <laughs> the centennial um, of the arrival of the pilgrims and the Mayflower. And then of course, 2020 happened. <laughs> and I just longed for a little bit more, uh, I don't know, I kept looking it up and it didn't seem like I could find what was happening or if anything would happen in the future around that, um, just honoring, honoring that time. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there are future plans and if that's um, at all being explored as far as making art or having an exhibit at the cultural center or somewhere else. Thanks. That's just something, uh, Deirdre, I can talk about uh, in the Q&A uh, if you remind me about it again, uh, because there are some things that I can point you to with relation to that, because there has been some fantastic developments that have been mostly oh, online, but um, a lot of the resources are still available. Oh, good. Thank you. So Tess, we have a couple of um, other requests coming in in the chat in terms of what our audience members want to know. Um, there's requests to learn more about items in the MFA's collection made by Native peoples um, who lived in the Northeast, um, an interest in learning about the origin of designs used in the art, about contemporary artists, and an interest in learning about people still making Native American art. So another interest in contemporary practices. Um, some questions about cross-cultural cross references I, between Native American communities. How far was their influence travel west or north to Canada? So maybe putting a geographic lens onto our inquiry. Um, how Native American, oops, Native Americans learn to be great artists. And maybe talk about training or craftsmanship perhaps. Um, more about false face masks, false face masks. We have a, a very curious group here. It's very exciting. I love uh, curiosity. <laughs> yeah. There's a question here about wanting to understand how to make a distinction between what objects were used by and for native peoples and those created for trade. So how do we draw those distinctions? And I think Anna or Anna um, wanted to jump in also and say something. Oh, yes. Hi, yes, thank you. I was just about to type my question in the chat. Um, I was wondering if, uh, I've been curious for a while about how museums currently are navigating the issues surrounding ownership of these native artifacts and relics. And I know there's been a lot of attention to acknowledging the uh, often unlawful uh, means at which uh, institutions acquired them. And I'm wondering, I wanted to, you know, I want to learn more about kind of what uh, organizations are doing with the uh, rightful owners and the tribes of these uh, of these artifacts, and kind of like what they're doing to uh, mediate that. That's actually something I will touch on. So you'll get a little bit of that today. I think this is really great. So I'm going to move on. Um, these are really fantastic things for me to keep in mind uh, when I go through my presentation today. So first. We are going to start. For diverse peoples have been making art in North America since time immemorial. The Native American gallery located in the basement of the wing includes a wide range of materials and subjects that embody the resilience, continuity and transformations of Native American cultures and nations across time and place. Here, artworks from regions across the continent the Great Lakes, Eastern United States, 
the plains, the Southwest, and the Pacific Northwest, including the Arctic, enter conversations with one another in ways that transcend their maker's distance in time and geography. Ancient Mississippian pottery was among the first works of art to enter the MFA's collection in 1876. 19th and 20th century Micmac quillwork, Pueblo pottery and weaving, Kwakwakiwak carving, and Lakota beadwork represent some of the objects that indigenous artists made for both communities and cross-cultural trade. Works of modern and contemporary art like Jackie Stevens's vessel, which actually you can see in the photograph on the left hand side, it's the white piece, white piece of pottery. And Stan Natchez's Guernica to Wounded Knee demonstrate new interpretations of traditional themes and techniques. Since the opening of the Art of the Americas Wing in 2010, this gallery has been dedicated to including indigenous cultures in the history of American art. In collaboration with indigenous community members, the MFA continues to work on strengthening its representation of native artists, histories, and perspectives on view. This gallery amplifies indigenous voices, setting a model for future installations across the Amer Art of the Americas Wing. We are going to focus today, however, on a small selection of our collection, the Woodlands and Great Lakes communities, specifically highlighting works in the Of This Land slideshow that was shared with you prior to this presentation. Indigenous peoples from across the region, notably the Wampanoag, my community, have also long shaped our local histories and culture. Why then doesn't our collection include any Massachusetts or Wampanoag art? Like many encyclopedic museums, the MFA began collecting Native American art in the late 19th century, when many East Coast collectors traveled to the Great Plains and the Southwest, inspired by their notions of quote unquote, authentic Indian culture. Works made by indigenous artists here in the woodlands, which spans the lands east of the Mississippi River, including the shores of the Great Lakes and Atlantic Ocean, have remained understudied and underrepresented in our galleries. While the museum has not yet collected works by Massachusetts or Wampanoag artists, our collection does include objects made in other parts of the woodlands, including from nearby communities in present day New England. This slideshow represents a small but important selection of woodlands art, mostly made by women in the 19th century, whose names are no longer known. We're actively working to expand this area of our collection through acquisitions, engagement with Native artists and community members, and new Indigenous-centered interpretation. We're striving to create a place where more voices and untold narratives of these communities are present. These images shown here are where our woodland art lives in the Native American art gallery space. So uh, where I'm talking down here actually is our woodlands case. Um, it's recently been revamped, so when you go in, it actually won't look like this anymore. It's filled with uh, Wabanaki beadwork, which is pretty cool, in my opinion. The first object I'd like to show you is this gorgeous multicolored sash. Many communities located in the eastern woodlands fashioned narrow hand plaited or finger woven sashes, or belts, they're often referred to as belts too that were used to bundle cradle boards, tow sleds and toboggans, or to fasten garments. Before the arrival of Europeans, the materials used in the manufacture of these items were locally sourced from trees and plants, such as the inner bark of basswood, cedar and elm, fiber from plants such as milkweed and dogbane, and strips of moose hide. On the East Coast, the Penobscot used the inner fibers of basswood and colored them with mineral dyes of black, red, brown, yellow, or blue. The finest finger weaving could be further embellished with dyed porcupine quills or even moose hair. After European colonization, artists began using commercially made and readily available materials obtained through trade, such as the spun wool and glass beads of this sash. The top left sash was made by a French Canadian Iroquois artist uh, known as a Haudenosaunee in the mid 19th century. The Iroquois or Haudenosaunee are an indigenous confederacy in Northeast North America. They were known during the colonial years to the French as the Iroquois League, uh, later as the Iroquois Confederacy and to English as the Five Nations, comprising of the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Oneida, the Cayuga and Seneca. 
like the other sashes shown here and the one I've shown previous is made of wool and has been finger woven. It features colors of yellow, red, green, and black. It is woven in a zigzag chevron pattern and would have had long fringe hanging from either end. The sash on the bottom left was made by a French Canadian Métis artist sometime between the mid 19th century and the late 19th century. The Métis are indigenous peoples in Canada and parts of the United States who are actually unique in being of mixed indigenous and European ancestry. In Canada, they're considered a distinct culture and are one of three groups of Canadian indigenous peoples referenced in their own constitution. This sash, likely made by a Métis woman, has been plaited with wool in bright gray, red, yellow, green, blue, white, and maroon. It, has, it was woven in a traditional arrow or chevron pattern. Like sashes of this nature, it features long fringe that dangles from either end of the sash. In fact, this fringe was meant to move with the person uh, and, and bring visual appeal to regalia, especially when dancing. The sash on the right hand side was also made by the French Canadian Métis artist somewhere between the mid 19th and late 19th century. It was made in La Saint-Jean, Quebec, Canada. Like the other two, it's made of wool, dyed maroon, white, dark blue, light blue, yellow, and green. And it has been finger woven or plaited in a traditional arrow or chevron pattern. Like sashes of this nature, it features long fringe that dangles from either end of the sash. These sashes, are known in French as saint fliché, uh, which is, uh, translates to arrow sash. They're also sometimes known as assumption sashes. Uh, so you'll see those in uh, that term in other museums and other locations. Um, and it's actually derived from the region in which they were first used and created, which I mentioned with this sash, it was made in L'Assomption, Quebec, Canada. This type of colorful sash is a traditional piece of French Canadian clothing that was adopted by the Métis as early as the 17th century. These sashes would have been typically worn around the waist and tied in a square knot at the hip. This artistic practice is one that continues within local communities even today. And the process is actually one that I'm quite familiar with. About three years ago, I first learned to finger weave from an elder in my community. She sat me down with the sash she was working on and allowed me to learn by doing. This is, uh, this is actually the sash that I made after learning on hers. Finger weaving is a fairly easy process once you get your fingers to behave easily. <laughs> In fact, there are some really good tutorials online for learning. Um, and if you're interested, Sophia is going to drop a link in the chat for a PDF that you can access and learn the process. Tess, there's also a couple of specific questions in the chat related to the sashes. Let's see. Uh, are the colors. Okay, you're, you're making questions about, you're asking questions about the colors of these. So these sashes, uh, the colors often reference the four directions or for uh, four sacred mountains. Um, in the Southwest, there's four sacred mountains. You'll see their types of sashes, uh, which are red, green, black, and white. Um, these are in very many ways the same way, uh, though up in the Northeast, those colors don't have the same significance. Uh, they're referencing the land, the sky, the earth, um, the, the oceans, the, the underworld, the upper worlds. Uh, they're tied to uh, cosmological and uh, cultural beliefs uh, within the Metis and the Iroquois communities. Uh, did they make the glass beads or import them? The glass beads were imported. Um, there's an, a, a, we don't have time for it tonight, but um, there's a huge long history about uh, bead imports um, and, and how they were brought within communities. In fact, these kinds of small beads that were on this piece were a much, much later uh, invention. Um, when you think of like the, the little beads that you give kids when they're young, they're kind of plasticky and big. Those are actually closer to the size of beads that were originally distributed and traded. They were called pony beads. Uh, and Tess, one more thing before you move on. Um, in terms of the finger weaving, um, this instruction, I know that some in, in the past we've, um, in some other workshops, talked about sort of what art forms, um, are, is it respectful and appropriate for people who are non-Native to do um, and which things would be sacred or, you know, in some way appropriation in order to do that. It, it sounds like finger weaving as a process is something 
um, that would be appropriate for teachers to yeah. do and faculty to do with their students. Is that correct? Okay. I think it's absolutely appropriate. Um, I think that the important thing is, is that you're not necessarily using the traditional colors or um, the same kind of traditional concept. You're teaching the process rather than the like making direct replicas because the replica process, the replica making a replica is a problem because then it's then you're replicating something that's not your own. Um, in fact, that's when I've done workshops before, the artists make it explicitly clear that they need you need to use your own creativity. So this PDF that um, Sophia has dropped in will show you the process of how to make it. And so um, I actually get into mine. Um, the materials have changed a little now today. So with reference to this, uh, with the advent of commercial yarns and aniline dyes, contemporary power regalia is more vibrant than ever. I used yarn that I got from a craft store uh, to create mine. I chose purple and white to mimic the colors of the Quahog shell that is used to make our wampum jewelry. This is actually my first sash I ever made. The finished product is on the right-hand side of the slide. I now make sashes that are much more complex. Um, this is my most recent sash that is currently in process. It's a sash that is woven in a chevron pattern and is about three times as wide as the other one. It's using the same colors as the other sash, but with better yarn this time. Um, and I actually intend to wear this one at my next powwow, which I'm hoping, fingers crossed, will happen this summer. Um, uh, Let's move on to the next piece if no one else has any other questions about this. Um, all right. The next Woodlands object I'd like to introduce to you is a quilled tea caddy. I'm a huge tea drinker. I even have my own cup of tea right here. Uh, it was made as a trade item for non-native consumption. This birch bark tea container represents a category of domestic object not known in the indigenous world until the arrival of the Europeans. However, the material from which it is made adapted perfectly to this use. Birch bark is waterproof, which is something that a lot of people don't know when it's solid, and it's also antimicrobial, uh, making it ideal for keeping household pests out of tea. Flowers, crosses, and ribbons are sewn with are sewn with dyed quills of red, white, and blue on the outside of this container, reflecting the kind of patriotic colors of the time. These floral motifs lend a feminine touch, which would have made it more appealing to its intended audience, the ladies of European households. According to family history, this birch bark canister was acquired in 1844 by George Mountain while on a missionary trip from Montreal to the Red River Settlement, which is a settlement of um, Native people in uh, Canada. The baskets in the upper left hand side consist of 12 nesting baskets, probably made by an unidentified Montaigne artist sometime between 1860 and 1900 in Quebec, Canada. Each birch bark basket in this nest of 12 has an octagonal base sewn together with spruce root. The sides are embellished with porcupine quill work in a pattern of flowers and leaves. The wooden rims also have quill work arrayed to form a striped and checkerboard pattern. The dozen baskets carefully graduated in size to nest together snugly. They range in diameter from 13 to 17.8 centime centimeters, which is about five and an eighth to seven inches, um, and in height from 4.5 to 5.1 centimeters, which is about an inch and, and three quarters to two inches. They're fairly small, actually. The birch bark envelope on the lower left-hand side was made by an Eastern Woodlands artist, probably of Huron descent. They're also known as the Wendat uh, in the 19th century. The Great Lakes region was a popular tourist destination for European Americans throughout the 19th century. By the end of the 18th century, the Ursulines had stopped making embroidered bark curios, but the growing number of American travelers along the St. Lawrence River could now find their souvenirs produced by Native American women. Women of the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet, as well as the Wendat, the Huron people of Lorette, produced curios in the manner of the Ursulines. One popular stop for visitors was the town of Lorette, outside of Quebec City, where the Wendat people who lived there would perform native dances to entertain visitors. 
The women of Lorette also profited from the tourist trade and the expanding interest in souvenirs, using their embroidery skill to embellish typical Victorian bibelots, such as this, the envelope case and the cigar case. It was made sometime in the 19th century of birch bark porcupine quills and it has a silk lining. The pouch on the right hand side was created in 1840 by a Micmac artist. It's made of birch bark, dyed porcupine quills, colored silk and white beads. Long before contact with Europeans, Micmac women of coastal Maine and Eastern Canada wove and stitched dyed porcupine quills into their clothing, jewelry and regalia. As British and French colonization dramatically shifted their lives and economies, they created souvenirs, such as birch bark containers with quillwork designs to sell to settlers and tourists around Niagara Falls and other scenic areas. Keenly aware of European and American tastes, these artists preserved traditional techniques within new forms. This small handbag evokes fashionable Euro-American versions of the time with its rounded body, flap closure, and short ribbon handle. Here is a useful diagram of the various stitches that can be used when sewing with quills. In the next video, you'll actually see the artist using the two thread sewing technique known as zigzag. So we're going to move on to this video here. Now, um, before we get started with this, uh, Sophia is going to paste it into the chat so that you guys can access the larger video at another time. There's also a whole series of other videos made by, uh, made by this group. Um, and it's a little muffled, so you'll mind the sound because it was taken during the workshop. So it really reflects the collaborative nature of making. During the residency, artists shared their quill work techniques, and they also learned and developed new ones. Some of these techniques are presented here. Okay, so you soak the quills until they get squishy, and warm water gets them softer a lot faster than cold, but cold water works if you let them sit there long enough. Which um, side do you use the it on? Do you use it on the rough side or the flat? Like this side or the other side? No, perfect. And I just lay the quill down and run the back of my thumbnail over it. Some people use you know, the back of their scissors or other items, and then you can pick it up and just crease it with your fingernail. Do we have to do it get flat, like, like paper, if you could crease paper. Like we leave the black tip on, because that's used to secure the quill in the moose skin. You just push yeah. that black tip in. And actually, do, you, do you want to get filmed too? So these are indigo dyed quills and they may act badly. And you fold the quill. And if you're doing a geometric design, it's folded at an angle. And we don't actually poke the quill into the or poke the needle into the quill. It's just sewn up right beside it there. And then we run the needle and the thread in the crease. And then stitch it down right on the other side, just through the moose skin. And you can see the thread just hides right in the crease. Turn it around, just kind of eyeball it, bend it again. Come up at the corner, right beside the quill. Run the thread and the needle into the quill. And go down right on the other side. And again, the stitch just hides right in the crease there. I'll do a couple more and then I'll... It takes a little bit of practice to get all of the bins even. Some people will draw lines. On. So we're going to stop there. Uh, and you feel free to watch uh, the longer video at another time. They go into more in-depth uh, processes and how it becomes a much more solid line of quills. Uh, it's pretty fascinating um, and really time consuming. Um, Maureen, I, yeah, it does sound a little gruesome, um, but that's okay. Uh, when you're harvesting, they're often harvested from um, carcasses that had been uh, contemporary day. A lot of artists use carcasses that have been hit by cars or things like that. Um, and so it does require a plucking from the actual animal. But 
That being said, a lot of artists also buy them commercially. Um, they buy them from suppliers, native suppliers in bulk. So you don't actually have to go through the process of like plucking them from the actual animal. Um, when she showed also, she was flattening up the quill with her thumb. Traditionally, um, historically, and a lot of people still do it today, they run them through their teeth because porcupine quills are barbed. And so um, in order to flatten and also pull the barbs off so you don't, you don't hurt yourself, uh, they would run them through their teeth. I know it sounds like so bad, but um, that's, that's kind of the process. Um, and if they were dyed, they would have been dyed beforehand, uh, before they were flattened and used. So we're going to move on here. The final woodlands object I want to show you is this hand carved knife. The crooked knife known to the Cree and many other nations of the Eastern woodlands as a makatagan is a one handed draw knife used by canoe builders, snowshoe makers and basket weavers. Though the name for the object changes among the various groups, the tool is universal in its employment principally by men, but occasionally by women in basket making. The maker would use this tool to strip and split the layers of bark, primarily from ash trees, to be used in their artwork. These utilitarian objects were ergonomically fitted to the individual hand of the owner and range from simple to elaborate in their decoration and design, such as this example, which mimics the shape of a horse's head. Uh, Here's a short video clip of how a crooked knife would be used. So once these strips of bark and wood are created, they're often dyed or treated in some way to preserve their life. Once that is done, the artist would begin using them in a weaving, such as these baskets. The basket on the left-hand side is a storage basket made by an Eastern Algonquian Nipmuc artist in the 1830s. It was made mostly like, most likely on the Nipmuc reservation located in the current day town of Grafton in central Massachusetts, right down the road from me. It's made from ash wood and has, plant, has painted floral imagery made using laundry bluing and Mohegan pink, which is now known to be a mixture of red and white lead. The basket in the upper right hand side is a lidded storage basket made by an unidentified Algonquian artist sometime in the late 18th century. It was made somewhere in southeastern Massachusetts, suggesting that it would have been made somewhere between the Nipmuc and Wampanoag communities. Like the other basket, it's made from ash, but it has printed paper and newspaper lining the inside of it. In fact, that's how we got some of the dates for this piece because the newspaper revealed when it was made. The third basket on the slide in the lower right hand side is a storage basket with a lid that was made by a Mohegan or Pequot artist between 1830 and 1900. Like the other two baskets, it was made by an Easter Woodlands community somewhere in the Northeast United States. It's made from ash and like the first basket features designs on its surface in laundry bluing and Mohegan pink. Each of these baskets would be constructed using splints that were most likely made with the use of a makatagan, like I showed earlier. These splints would be split or used as is to fashion baskets like these. First, the splints would be softened using water so that they're pliable and ready to be used. Then the artist would carefully use a weaving technique known as plaiting. Now, don't get that confused with plating, it's a different thing, uh, because they're similar but also distinct. I'm sorry, plating and plaiting, uh, the opposite way. Can't read my writing today. Uh, the plating technique involves crossing strips of material over and under each other, creating what resembles a checkerboard pattern. Uh, the plating technique is utilized in order to make flat wefts, which can be used to create the bottom sides and a cover of a basket. Uh, and Elizabeth, you asked a question, has the ash borer invasion caused problems for contemporary basket makers? It absolutely has. Um, it's actually made it quite hard for uh, especially the Wabanaki community up in Maine 
to be able to access their traditional materials. If you know anything about the Wabanaki, their, actually their creation story is inherently tied to the ash tree. Uh, and so they, they're, they're threatened. Contemporary basket makers are definitely threatened. Um, it's, it's gotten a lot easier now because uh, there's more understanding and more awareness of the ash borer. And so people have been working to preserve these trees. But it, it's interesting because um, a lot of contemporary makers are now having to turn to other materials or find way to conserve the materials they already have. Um, it's, it's been a struggle. Um, but I do know some contemporary basket makers. Um, one that comes to mind is Gio Neptune, if you uh, look him up. He's, he's been struggling with access materials. And in fact, it's uh, changed his practice in a way that's um, been really interesting and has been offering new ways to experiment with new materials like sweet grass uh, and, and have them be more prominent than just ash. Does anyone else have any other questions about this? Uh, Geo Neptune, G-E-O-N-E-P. T-U-N-E. He's a contemporary basket maker. No one has any questions. I'm going to move on. And if you have any more, don't feel free to put them in the chat and I'll answer them. <laughs> now, when you think what is American and what is Native American, you all think different things, like we discussed earlier in the KWL. That is something that we're actually trying to reconcile with currently in the Art of the Americas department and throughout our wing. We're making some very important changes throughout the galleries to reflect the new perspectives and more diverse voices that should be present in our spaces. I want to share some of those changes uh, we have made with you today. One of the more important changes that we've made recently to our gallery spaces was removing two objects rather than displaying them. In these pictures, you'll notice that there are two mounts that seem to be missing their objects. These mounts were intentionally left there as a reminder of what is not on display. In the label, we ask, what is missing here? In this case, we've removed two ancient membrace bowls from this display due to their sensitive status as funerary objects among the indigenous communities of New Mexico and Arizona. The decision to remove these works is part of the MFA's continuing effort toward compliance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, also known as NAGPRA. This 1990 law requires the respectful return or repatriation and disposition of human remains, funerary and sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. Removing sensitive objects from view and or repatriating them are not only acts of respect, but ways to work toward greater understanding and reciprocity. Such actions encourage a continued dialogue between museums and native tribes, communities, and organizations. They promote awareness of cultural practices and beliefs and ensure that indigenous peoples are treated with dignity and included in decisions about the public display about, of their works of art. Unlike the rest of these works I've shown you, this work is not located inside the Native American gallery space, but rather greets you as you enter the first floor of the America's Wing. In an effort to integrate Native American art throughout the America's Wing and bring it out of the basement, so to speak, we've created what we are calling interventions in various spaces throughout the museum. This, rather than an intervention, I suppose, is just plain integration. These works are by the late PC Cannon. A distinguished art collector sits comfortably among his treasures. A landscape painting evocative of Vincent van Gogh, a wicker chair and a boldly patterned Denet rug. In the portrait at the right, a distinguished gentleman poses in a domestic interior on an antique Chippendale chair of the type on display in our galleries. The subject of these portraits are elderly members of the Kiowa tribe in traditional dress, moccasins, leggings, and trade cloth shirts Yet, they are portrayed in a formal typical, a format typical of portraits of white elites. PC Cannon, a painter, poet, and musician of Caddo and Kiowa descent, overturned deeply rooted cultural conventions to literally and figuratively center his Native American subjects. Cannon drew on a range of sources, historic photographs of tribal leaders, 18th century British and American portraits, and the bold and unexpected color combinations of pop artists like Andy Warhol. 
to challenge expectations and stereotypes of the quote unquote vanishing race. His paintings powerfully and humorously disavow the work of generations of American artists, including painters and sculptors on view at the MFA who erased indigenous people from the nation's history and landscape. Now the entrance to the wing also has a new label that greets you. And you can see it above the paintings. There's actually uh, Art of the Americas translated into 12 different languages. In it, we ask, what do we mean by Art of the Americas? And who do we describe as an American artist? The galleries before you bring together works of art made throughout North, Central, and South America, as well as the Caribbean by, by artists from many cultures and nations. Spanning 3,000 years from the ancient civilizations of Mesoamerica to the modern art capitals of Mexico City and New York, these objects within our galleries embody the essential human desire to create meaning and beauty through art and craft, a drive shared by indigenous peoples and colonial settlers and immigrant artists, the free and enslaved, artists trained and self-taught. Shaped by global contexts of migration, war, commerce, politics, and cultural exchange, the works on view hold many stories and reflect a wide range of ideas about America and Americanness as a place, an identity, and as an aspiration. At the MFA, we are committed to presenting creative voices from across the Americas, including those historically underrepresented in our galleries, among them women, indigenous artists, Black artists, and artists of color, as well as self-taught and folk artists. These diverse artistic visions inspire us and challenge our assumptions about American art and culture. Now, while our collection includes many works made for elite patrons in the regions that became the United States, we're working to expand, contextualize, and diversify our holdings and to consider the objects in our care from new and overlooked perspectives. As we focus on exploring new themes and recovering lost histories, we actually invite you and our visitors and, and others to help create change by sharing feedback. So uh, Emily's going to drop, um, Sophia is going to drop our Gmail into the chat as well as our Instagram account. Feel free to, to email us with questions and things that you're, uh, you're interested in, in knowing and, and your feedback on the things that you're hearing about today. Um, and I saw a question in the chat about the Mimbrace bowls. Um, they are actually now uh, put um, securely and safely and respectfully off view um, in storage. The, the problem with Mimbrace bowls, and it's a much more complex conversation for another day, is that they're from a community that distributed so widely that when you go through the process of NAGPRA, you have to consult with over I think it's over 10 different tribes now in the southwest area including a, a community in northern Chihuahua Mexico which adds even further complication because it's international and that can, consultation process there today there has not been a precedent set for their return so um, they will stay off view uh, they no one uh, besides someone from that community um, or me um, or someone that, people that feel comfortable with seeing them, um, non-Indigenous people will not be able to access them. Um, they'll stay off view uh, respectfully. It's something that I've done in other museums that I've worked at, um, and I've worked quite extensively with members materials before, and so um, in an effort to respect the fact that they are burial items and respect the fact that there's um, no precedent that's been set to this day about their return, they'll remain off view. It's something I'm um, really, really, I find really important. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Elizabeth, I can uh, send that to Sophia and to uh, Emily and the group um, after this is over. And we can get we can get that statement to you um, and those essential questions, Jessica, we can get those to you as well. Uh, they're part of our label outside of the America's wing, so you can also see them there. Now, you go to the second floor, and when you get off the elevator or the stairs, you're greeted by a work by Jackson Pollock and two pieces of pottery by Indigenous makers, one being by Lucy Lewis. Patched lines, capped spirals, and stepped motifs are abstractions of the landscapes around Acoma Sky City in present-day New Mexico. 
the place always prepared the original home of these living works, of these two pieces of ceramic works. Working in the 1940s, Lucy Lewis was inspired by the creations of her ancestors, as was the unidentified maker of this mid-century, Oya, on the right-hand side. The work by Lucy Lewis is on the left-hand side. It's that kind of um, triangular and hatched piece. Lewis not only influenced her contemporaries, but also later generations within her Ha'aku community, who have ensured the continuity of cultural practices. When paired with Jackson Pollock's number 10, 1949, which is on display nearby, you can see it in the background of these pictures, both the Oya and Lewis's jar speak to the rhythmic quality of the process of making. Coil by coil, brushstroke by brushstroke, each of these pots was constructed and carefully decorated by deft hands, as if the pot and the maker were engaged in a fluid dance. Though many credit the development of abstraction to New York male artists in the mid-century, like Pollock, such conventions have existed in Native art for millennia. When paired together, these three works represent a cross-section of art from the 1940s and show the landscape through different styles of abstraction. The final, uh, the final intervention I'd like to talk to you guys about um, is this. This Oya resides in the American Renaissance Gallery. In this case, this ceramic vessel was put in a gallery space that is synchronously concurrent. All of the works in this gallery were made during the same time period that this vessel was created. I want to introduce you to this beautiful Southwestern pot made by one of the most well-known 19th century two-spirit potters, Aroa Oach. I want to take a minute for you to get a close look at this vessel as it really is remarkable in its decorative quality. The designs that you can see on the surface of the Oya range from quatrefoils, which are located in here, uh, capped spirals. Uh, the, these are capped spirals right here. Abstract feather motifs, um, which some of what you can see in here inside this quatrefoil, this is a capped, this is a, a, an abstract feather motif, um, and cross hatching um, up in here. A defining feature of her work and many decorative Southwestern ceramics is the spirit break, which uh, I brought out for you in this big picture in the lower corner, that, that break in the drawing. A spirit break is the disruption of the continuous line on the shoulder of this jar and is a visual, visual representation of a sipapu, the place of emergence and origin of the Laguna people. All of these painted designs were created with a yucca brush and materials such as colored clay, which is the red, um, which you can't really see well on here, but these, these kind of um, uh, wide triangular like uh, figure um, pieces are red and the caps on the spiral are also red. Um, and Rocky Mountain Beeweed, which is the black paint. So all of the black design is made from uh, Rocky Mountain Beeweed that were derived from the land in New Mexico where the Laguna Pueblo is located. Now, I used a term before that many of you watching may not be familiar with, though some of you are, which I'm really excited about, uh, two-spirit. There are many definitions and understanding of what two-spirit is, and each of them is nation-specific. The term first came into use as a way to bridge Western and non-Western understandings of gender and sexual diversity among Indigenous peoples. The most common parallel to the two-spirit role is someone who is non-binary or transgender. Aroa Och was a Kukwimu potter, born of the Roadrunner clan from the Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico. As a two-spirit individual, Aroa Och held the sacred role of both a man and a woman within her community. Now, Sophia is going to drop a link to a, an, a really useful video um, if you're interested in knowing more about this term. Um, it's actually a Dio Neptune, who I mentioned before, the basket maker. They are two-spirit. Um, and they have put together a really wonderful video to explain uh, the significance of that. Now, these interventions and integrations are small parts of larger ideas that the department is currently working on integrating at a larger scale. In fact, in the coming year, this is, this is the first time I'm actually talking about this, um, there'll be two new installations of gallery spaces dedicated to telling the voices of Indigenous people, and they won't be in the basement. Yay! 
The Lane and Heed Gallery on the second floor is being reoriented to include the perspectives of the Wabanaki people of Maine, including basketry and other artworks made by Indigenous people, as well as, which is really exciting, their language on the labels. We've worked with a, a language scholar uh, in Maine, um, and he's going to help us build some really wonderful uh, interpretation for that gallery. In fact, um, we have recently undertaken a, a larger initiative called the Translation Project to include labels in other languages. And a label that we wrote with him will be on our Robert Peake portrait um, on the first floor. And then on the third floor, after Women Take the Floor comes down, we will be including in our reinstallation of the permanent galleries, a space dedicated to the indigenous Southwest, specifically New Mexico in the 20th century. And this will also include labels and other interpretation uh, done in the Tewa language, which is a language that's spoken at the San Ildefonso Pueblo. So I, uh, I am finished talking at you. Katabatanu, uh, everyone, thank you for letting me talk today. Um, and so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And we're going to move on to the next part of our, of our workshop. Thank you so, so much, Tess. Um, I want to now um, give everyone a chance to spend a little time uh, talking in small groups. Um, we're going to just drop into the chat a, a discussion question, and we'll give you about 10 minutes to uh, go into a breakout room and talk with colleagues um, about this question um, that is in the chat. We envision this workshop to be about what is American, Native American art at the MFA. Now think about what it looks like in your classroom um, to think about that same question. So uh, we'll be releasing you to breakout rooms in a moment. We'll give you, uh, you know, a little signal. You'll you'll get it via Zoom when there's a minute left um, to come back, and then we'll have time for further discussion and Q and A. Uh, and just a reminder that if you are typing in the chat, it just stays where you are um, within your breakout room. So thank you so much. And you can look for that invite for the breakout room in just a minute. Hey, Tess, I assume Aquina is on Mother's Vineyard? Yeah, that's right behind me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I read this book, Caleb's Crossing. Did you ever read that book? I have it. Great. I have it right down, right down to my, yeah. lab, my library down there, actually. Tess, I wonder um, if we want to get maybe one or two people to share a little bit about what they discussed on that question of what is American. And I am going to ask um, for someone who's in a classroom teaching, we have a lot of um, people who do gallery teaching here too. Um, and um, we'll start with that uh, question or a share out from someone who does um, in classroom teaching either um, in the K to 12 or the college level. Yeah, Victoria. Victoria. Yeah. So in our group, we were talking about like ideal times to bring up this kind of conversation with our students. And we brought up that kind of uh, Thanksgiving period where we have a lot of misinformation being kind of pulled around. And one of the ideas that our group actually had was hoping that the MFA might do a little um, Wampanoag side of the story with information like that. But also we talked about kind of looking around our classroom, seeing what students we had before us, just to get back to that question and um, how to really translate that to our kids, like talking about talking about the land first and then moving from there. So actually, we we currently don't have any plans for it, but I can tell you right now, the PBD Essex Museum does. I, in fact, I worked on it a couple of years ago, um, and one of the one of their sections that they're planning is a, a reorientation of the Thanksgiving myth, quote unquote, um, and centering Indigenous people within that that narrative, rather than it being about the pilgrims coming in and meeting the Native people and they shared their things with us. Well, actually, it's a little bit different than that story. Um, not gruesome, but different. So you can see it there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, that idea of, you know, thinking about the times of year where students are faced with sort of stereotypes and myths that, you know, vanishing myth, 
and having that moment to do that intervention to say, okay, Native people are still here. Native people um, are actually very diverse peoples and that there is a local community that um, very much is still present um, in Massachusetts or wherever you are. Um, but, and also to think about throughout the year when you're teaching about American art, American history, like where is that moment where when you're sharing an example of work, of a work of art, if you're talking about flowers, if you're, you know, when do you bring up a that tea caddy instead of, you know, a floral painting that you might have otherwise used, even if it's just sort of like the background on your slide um, for something that you're doing. That's one of the things that I've had a lot of conversations with educators about is just um, whenever you're teaching about the United States um, or North America um, or you know throughout the world that you're thinking about um, indigenous art being just among the art that you share um, and showcase and that you in your own classroom sort of change what we would call the canon for what students are learning um, is American art. One other person and then we'll move on to q and I'm gonna scroll through and see if there's hands. We can also move into questions. Um, if anyone wants to speak or you can also um, go back to the chat. One more thing from our group, but oh, yeah. uh, interesting that the, the using words and correcting when kids say Indian. And I thought it was interesting. Um, someone in our group said it brings up an opportunity to also talk about India and uh, kind of another culture. And also in our group, we kind of, um, made sure when speaking about showing, um, thinking about America and Native American, thinking about the whole map and showing a map, but then of course, introducing the great piece we saw the last session that um, one quick to see Smith tribal map and the importance of um, talking in the present and also, also um, including contemporary uh, artists and works as well. Are you going to jump in? I was just looking for a I was going to say, anyone want to, you can, I, like, no question is off the books. No question is stupid. Like, ask me. I'm I'm the kind of person that I'm not going to be offended by someone not knowing something. So. And I was just going to say that the question of, you know, what terminology to use, actually, my understanding, and, and Tess has more expertise, um, you know, my understanding is that different people also use different terms within communities, certainly among communities, there's a lot of regional differences in terms of when the term Indian or Indian is preferred, even, um, you know, whether people call themselves Native, Native American, Indigenous. Um, and I believe I have a resource that I'll, I'll stick in the chat, and if not, we'll send it in a follow-up email, um, but Tess can speak to that too. So that's something like Emily said is, is pretty um, subjective uh, depending on who you're asking. Um, and so like I, I prefer to call myself indigenous or Native American. Uh, I know people will call themselves uh, Indian and it's a source of pride for them because they've reclaimed that word um, for Native communities. Uh, there are people that absolutely hate it. There are people that would prefer you to call them by their community name rather than Native American or indigenous. So. I have a lot of friends who are Navajo. Um, they're also known as Diné, and like those kinds of terms are used interchangeably by different people. And so it really, um, it's it's really up to the person that you're speaking with or talking about. You want to use if like say you're talking about a specific artist, so you're talking about Jean Christophe Smith. You want to use her tribal designation, not just Native American, because that's a source of pride. That's who they are. That's their identity. When you talk about me, I'm Wampanoag. Um, those are, that's where you really want to get specific if you know it. If you do not and you can't find it anywhere, the Native American or Indigenous tend to be the preferred, the preferred uh, language that's used. Um, Aboriginal, if you ever hear that word, that refers to Australian Indigenous people. If you ever hear the word First Nations, for the words First Nations, that refers to Native American or uh, Indigenous tribal nations and organizations from Canada. And so those are very specific terms that are used for very specific areas. Um, and so it, it really kind of depends. Yeah. 
um, excuse me, I think that for me, I'm looking for like resources to help me beyond this fantastic presentation today um, to educate myself um, more. So if you have any, um, you know, art teacher, uh, Native American, Indigenous, how to talk about it in the classroom, that would be really appreciated. Um, thank you for this great presentation. I'm about to um, pop in the chat something from um, the organization Agamat, um, which is a longtime partner of the MFA um, and did a workshop um, that perhaps some of you attended three years ago, maybe. Um, and um, it's about um, indigenous terminology in this case, but their website in general is one place to look for resources and also for um, workshops. Um, and there's also a link in there to another organization we um, have long partnered with, the Upstander uh, Institute is actually a whole bunch of organizations related to um, the Upstander project and uh, a series of films they've made. Um, so we'll put those um, a, a link to that in the chat as well as one place and I'll, I'll let Tess speak to others. Uh, Akamat was actually what I was going to suggest. So you got it, you got it perfectly there, Emily. Um, they're pretty wonderful. Don Spears and uh, does an amazing job uh, to to uh, share uh, knowledge and to be very open about uh, the kinds of questions that people often feel uncomfortable asking. Um, so uh, it's a it's a great resource. Um, yeah, and, and Donna. And Donna um, Spears and then um, Chris Newell, who's now actually the director up at the Abbey Museum, which we've linked to elsewhere in the chat, um, did the workshop a few years ago. Um, if you're looking for a really fantastic uh, book for you to read, not necessarily for your students to read, but for something for your education, um, a book called Dawn Land Voices, if I can get it to come through. Um, it's uh, it won't. <laughs> the stupid background. Um, <laughs> it's it's a really amazing book. It's an anthology of Indigenous writing from New England, um, and it's uh, everything from um, understanding the progression of Micmac law to to um, we're not savages to treaties to saving fish and wildlife to um, the killing of languages and the immersion education. These are kind of things for more for you, they, but they go um, community by community. So they go Micmac, they go Penobscot, they go uh, Abenaki, they go Nipmuc, they do Narragansett, Wampanoag. I mean, it goes into every nation specifically. And it's a pretty amazing book. Let's see if I can get it to come out. Um, there we go. And it uh, it's, it's a really, really, really wonderful anthology. It's by uh, Siobhan Senior, it's the, the editor. Um, and it's something that's been really important in the last few years in terms of expanding our knowledge of the history of this area to include indigenous peoples. Um, it includes actual documents. Yes, I will write the names in the chat. It includes actual uh, first uh, hand sources too, which is really fantastic to learn from. Let's see, I'll put the name in the chat. Cool. Don Land. And I just put in um, the name of a book um, by oh, two yes. authors. Dina, also, some of you may have attended um, an institute that we did a couple summers ago um, that Dina um, was part of, and she's part of that Upstander project. Um, they have a book that um, is, I think, commonly referenced by teachers, and um, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz also has the Indigenous. People's History of the United States, I believe it's called. Um, that's a book that also is commonly used, um, I know, by a lot of teachers as a reference. Yes, and Indigenous People's History is a fantastic book also, because if you've ever read um, uh, Howard Zinn's uh, uh, People's, People's History, History of the United States, yeah. um, it's a pretty amazing companion to that. Uh, and it talks a lot about the things that he leaves out, so. Tess, are you gonna, are you putting that um, yes, I am in the <laughs> process of typing. Busily typing away. Um, one thing that um, we'll also um, put in the chat in a moment is we actually have a sort of teacher ready version of the slideshow that um, Tess um, was, we 
the reason that we asked Tess to do this workshop is in part because we just knew she would have a lot to share, but we also were inspired by that slideshow and knew that it could be very useful. And so um, we made a Google Slides version of it so that you can really easily use it in the classroom and have a few um, resources that we've mentioned in the chat linked to um, already there as well. Thank you so much, Sophia. <laughs> Um, another book also uh, on the topic of Thanksgiving, if you're looking for something for you to read that then is, um, you can kind of disseminate that information to your to your students. It, uh, it's called This Land is Their Land. Um, and it's by David J. Silverman. Um, and it's a really fantastic book about um, the Wampanoag history, Plymouth Colony, and the troubled history of Thanksgiving. And so it'll give you a lot of material to kind of work with and um, understanding what, what that true history is. And I'll mention that we had a workshop um, just earlier this month um, with one of our colleagues who um, specifically talked about indigenous, contemporary indigenous art, uh, and that will be available um, relatively soon um, on YouTube. But if you are looking for it more urgently, um, we can also share some information um, with you now. Um, you can just send us an email. Um, and if you are, you know, interested in asking more questions and uh, just talking to other educators about this. It certainly um, is something that we care a lot about in terms of how uh, the museum is shaping the way that young people, um, no matter what their age and adults, um, are thinking about art or thinking about the history of this place. And so it's a conversation that we will continue to have and that we want to keep having with educators. And so um, feel free to reach out. Are, are we allowed to ask another question? Is yes. <laughs> no? So I'm chomping at the bit, Tess, because I struggle um, with how to make um, Native American cultures and information alive in the present. Um, so much is done with the past and historic and it's the invisibility of Native Americans all around us now. Um, I teach elementary, you know, could be for any grade, but do you have any suggestions on how to enter into that? Um, best practice meaningfully? To bring Native art into your classroom, to bring Native New England into your classroom? Not just, na just um, Native American awareness and culture, not just art, but just... Um, just in general? Just in general, yeah. Um, I think that one of the best ways that I have seen and experienced is not necessarily calling it out, um, having it just be integrated. To have, you know, you 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 do put the tribal like designation and things like that associated with whatever you're talking about, but having it just be a part of, rather than having it be a separate thing that you have to do a whole lesson on, and you know, it makes it all more complicated, and no one really wants to write a new lesson. I understand because that's a lot of work as a teacher to write a whole new lesson about something and then try to, you know, change what they've already been taught, rather than like overtly trying to shift the narrative in a way that kids won't get because they'll often go, wait a minute, someone else told me this. Wait a minute, I know this. You know, especially young kids, young kids will be like, uh-uh, I know this thing and you're wrong. Well, rather than telling them that they're wrong, just say, okay, well, we're gonna talk more about this and it's have it just be integrated. Like find a piece that I have talked about today. And if you're talking about um, how something is embellished with art and color, you can bring up the birch bark tea container or you can bring up the the sash because those are incredibly colorful any assumption sashes are really really colorful and they talk about contrast and they talk about line and so you can use those as examples rather than talking about like jackson pollock or mondrian when you're talking about line you can use a quilled piece uh, i think if you just make it a normal thing you don't make it some pulled out idea um, that it's an easier way to kind of start integrating and honoring the fact that this has been systematically left out of art historical canon and art canon in general. And I think Tess in general we we advocate for sort of the both and also like I think a yeah. lot of teachers if you can do a lesson yeah. that really addresses that and you know is part of your overall reframing. I, we know a lot of teachers are thinking about you know how are they approaching 
uh, they're teaching through an anti-racist lens, like how are they thinking um, about these larger ways that they're influencing, you know, how their students are thinking about the world. Um, you know, we, we have this exhibition, Women Take the Floor, that's up right now at the MFA. And there were all these debates of like, do you separate out women or do you have them integrated? And I think, you know, we, we are of the both and um, mindset at the museum right now. And I think it can be that way in your classroom too. There are moments to really separate out, raise up, make it really clear that this has been historically left out. And so sometimes there's um, a, a moment to historically put in, <laughs> um, and, or not historically, to in the present, put in and, and make a specific lesson. But if you can't, or, or if that isn't going to land as well, or also like, it doesn't need to be on its own. And I think that idea that if it is sort of just part of how you are making choices um, in your teaching along the way, and it's normalized for you, it can become normalized for your student and thinking, oh, whenever I'm thinking about American art, whenever I'm thinking about American history, I'm also thinking about the perspective um, of Native peoples um, and the art and creativity of Native peoples. It is time. So I will say we'll stay on for a few more minutes if someone else has a question, but we know some of you need to leave um, for the evening. So I'm gonna encourage Sophia to pop the survey in the chat. Um, and we'll also be sending that via email. Um, and we have time for maybe one more, or two more questions, um, quick ones, <laughs> or longer ones that we can answer more fully another time <laughs> that you wanna raise now. Deb, I see your hand up. You're muted. <laughs> okay. Um, so this may be a longer one, uh, longer question. Uh, but um, Dolly and I uh, touched on this when we were in our breakout room, and uh, which is sort of how, if we're talking about art from a sort of material culture point of view, um, I think that I can really see how um, we would integrate um, Native American pieces into uh, a discussion. Um, you know, take uh, your Jackson Pollock and those um, beautiful um, pots, and I think it, you know, that that seems very clear. Um, I guess what's more unclear to me is, and I'm, I don't know if I can come up with something um, um, on the spot here, um, but um, let's say we're in the Italian, well, of course that wouldn't be American art. Um, okay, let me think. Um, uh, we're in some aspect of teaching the American art at the um, uh, undergraduate level and we're looking at some economic forces or you know, talking about how art has responded uh, to let's say the industrial revolution or something like that. Are there treatments of Native American art that you can point us to that would help us to know what, what Native American pieces or works or um, what have you, we could incorporate into such a discussion. Does that, does that make Okay, so I've, I've got one for you. So um, when you think about like progress and industrialization and um, the onset of technology, um, one of the most fascinating stories for me has always been, and this is about Southwest, um, is when the railroad came through New Mexico and that area. It greatly affected the kinds of work that artists were making. Uh, it greatly affected how much they were making, and it was it greatly affected who they were making it for. Right. So there are quite a few pots, um, some in our collection, and the things that you can look for, I'll, I'll tell you, um, there that are were made for the tourist market. They were made for the train. Yeah. The so works. Um, so uh, the works that are tend to be smaller in nature, they're more handheld, um, and those that often had um, appliques, so like frogs and other things on their surface, like actual sculptural details, were often made for the outside market because that was something that tourists liked. They were hands held because they could be put in a suitcase really easily on the train. And so those kinds of works are, I think, are a fantastic way to talk about how um, technology and industrialization affected the market and the people. And the thing is, is that it made it more widely distributed 
it made it more widely known. And so it became, you know, Santa Fe became the art mecca it is because of the railroad. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there, the artists, talk about that. did the artists make, make more money for their work? Because oh, of God, they made almost no money for their work. Yeah, it was um, middlemen. It, it was very little. Um, actually, if you're up in Women Take the Floor, I can tell you this. This is a fun little detail. If you're and up in Women Take the Floor and you're in that back right gallery space where there's all these pots by Maria Martinez, if you look very carefully, um, some of them are put up pretty high. But if you look very carefully, the underside have their prices on them still. Huh. And it's pretty, pretty low prices. Um, things that you would think you would just gasp at like two and three dollars. And, and there's the there are these magnificent works that you know, today now and are seen today as these, as these works that are, are to be praised and Priceless. they were sold for such little money. And the thing is, is that that kind of money then was really big. It ensured that the family could have food and the family could sustain themselves on the Pueblos because res life is not the easiest life in the world. Um, that being said, it also, it, these works were affected by the market in that they affected what designs were done more and the things that were popular. Um, and so some things were made more than others and other things were made for only community and other things transitioned to being trade wares. And so um, the Southwest is a really great way to talk about like the advent of industrialization and, um, and technology and movement. That, 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 that's great, a great response. I appreciate it, thank you. And do you think, Tess, that also gives you an opportunity as an educator to talk about the uh, sort of perceptions of or values placed on sort of the making of art? I mean, it gives you an opportunity to talk about the notion of authorship and um, the notion of the artist with a capital A, you know, in a very sort of Western centric view as opposed to an indigenous set of practices like when you talk about Maria Martinez and to think about that sort of distinction as a useful counterpoint, a useful point of dialogue. Absolutely. I mean, too often Native art is relegated to unidentified now. And so when there are artists' names associated with it, it's a really, really great opportunity to talk about um, how art functions within Native communities. Um, and that's at a much larger conversation, but like when we were learning, when we were working on our translation project and the new label out in the front of the wing with all those languages, we, I, I said to my colleagues, I said, you know, in the Wampanoag language, we don't have a word for art. There is no word for art. And in many indigenous languages, that's the case too, because art is inherently a part of everything. And so there's no need to designate it as something else. And so, that gets into much complicated, much more complicated areas, but is a really important conversation to be having, especially in conversation with Native art, um, and especially in juxtaposition to European art. Thank you so much again. Um, I'll also mention that if teachers are, have a specific topic like industrialization, um, we do have a program that's primarily for K to 12, but where we have an initiative uh, called Art Finders, which will also pop in the chat, um, that uh, invites teachers to tell us about something they're working on, and we will send uh, suggestions of works in our collection and some related resources in some cases, um, so that we can help you think about where you can um, incorporate Native art um, or other topics too, and it's something that we are doing is thinking about, okay, whatever the topic is, is, is there a way for us to include Indigenous art um, in the recommendations that we're providing to teachers just to model um, what Matt Tess mentioned earlier. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you again to Tess um, for being such a valuable colleague and for providing uh, all of your insights and uh, sharing so much this evening. Um, and thanks to Dahlia and Sophia and to all of you um, for attending with us. Uh, we invite you to give us your feedback um, in that survey and to come see us again soon. Take care.